In the last part, we showed how to go from the conservation of energy over here to the conservation of energy in a slightly ordered form in terms of wave variables over here. And what happens if we assume that the Schrodinger, well, that the solutions to the Schrodinger equations in terms of wave functions are the sine and the cosine? So to recap on the last lecture, I'll just start a new screen since I'm out of space and I'll write down the most important things again. Now, as always, we start off with the Schrodinger equation, that is, I h bar d psi over dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi over dx squared plus v psi. The next important thing is the conservation of energy, which is E equals T plus V, where this T is the kinetic energy and this V is the potential that the particle is in. Now, from the last video, I don't think I made it absolutely clear, but this is a capital V, and the V for half mv squared, which is the definition of kinetic energy, is a small v, and the two are for velocity and for potential, and they're very different. I just wanted to make sure that that was absolutely clear in this video. Next we have rewriting this as psi h bar omega equals psi h bar squared k squared over 2m plus psi v. Then we have the two wave functions that we're not sure which one will actually be the physical one yet. So that's cos kx minus omega t and psi 2, which equals sine kx minus omega t. And the main result from the last part, which is that their derivatives with respect to time are just multiples of each other. So d psi 1 with respect to time was omega psi 2. d psi 2 with respect to time was minus omega psi 1. And differentiating with, with respect to space twice, we get minus k squared psi 1. Well, this is 1 or 2. So I'll just save some space by writing 1 comma 2. So this is everything that we needed from last time. Now, while it might seem like a waste of time that I've spent nearly half the lecture talking about this, I did want to make absolutely sure that you knew why we did what we did last lecture and what was what in it. So, now we'll get on with the new stuff. The first thing we'll do is actually something really boring, and that's rewriting the energy conservation in this form in terms of psi 1 and psi 2. Now, this might seem like a complete waste of time, but it does help us see something a lot clearer later on. So, the first thing we're going to do in this video is rewrite this energy conservation equation in terms of psi 1 and psi 2. So, just rewriting it twice and replacing psi with psi 1 and psi 2. So, that's psi 1. Well, this might seem like a complete waste of time. It will make seeing something later on much, much easier. So just bear with me, and that's psi 2 h bar omega equals psi 2 h bar squared k squared over 2m plus psi 2 v, and that's an m. Okay, so now we actually bring in complex numbers for real in here, and we suppose that for some reason we want to rewrite this psi in terms of psi 1 and psi 2, and we do this by writing it in this form. So right now, the first thing we bring in from, well, the only thing we bring in from complex analysis is the fact that we can treat any function, any complex function, as two separate real functions, one of them simply being multiplied by the unit imaginary number i. So with that said, we'll rewrite the Schrodinger equation yet again, this time in terms of the uh, psi 1 and psi 2. I h bar d psi 1 plus i psi 2. This in brackets just so we know that the derivative is acting on both of them at the same time. Equals minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi 1 plus i psi 2 over dx squared plus v 
psi 1 plus i psi 2. Now, for, now, as we said just now, we can treat both of these equations as two separate equations, one with a real part and one with an imaginary part. Since a real number can't be an imaginary number by definition, each part of the equation has to equal itself. That is, the real part on this side of the equality equals the real part on this side of the equality, and the same thing for the imaginary part. So we can actually separate this into two equations. And since the imaginary number, i, is just a constant, when we differentiate it when it's multiplied by a function of t or with a function of s, it just pops out of the brackets. What we get here is minus h. The minus here is because the i squared from here and here is minus d psi 2 over dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m d psi d squared psi 1 over dx squared plus v psi 1. This is the real part of this equation. And now for the imaginary part, we'll just drop i, since everything is multiplied by i. And then we have h bar d psi 1 over dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi 2 over dx squared plus v psi 2. At this point, you might think that we haven't done anything. But from the last video, again, looking at these things over here, we can actually rewrite the derivatives of psi with respect to time and with respect to space as multiples of the other psi. So what this actually ends up as is minus h multiplied by minus omega psi 1 which is equal to minus h bar square over 2m. And looking this one up, that is this one. That's minus k squared psi 1 plus v psi 1. And same for this. Oh, actually, we'll just simplify this right now. The two minuses cancel, so that h bar omega psi 1. The minuses here cancel as well, so that's uh, psi 1 h bar squared k squared over 2m plus v psi 1. And for this one, we get h bar omega psi 2 equals minus h bar squared over 2m minus k squared psi 2. That's this term over here. Again, looking at this one. Plus v psi 2. So simplifying this one as well, we end up with h bar omega psi 2 equals the minuses cancel. So that's k squared h bar squared over 2m psi 2 plus v psi 2. And lo and behold, when we look at this one over here, we actually see that it's exactly the same as this one over here. So what we've actually done is shown that this equation well, the, the Schrodinger equation is actually nothing more than the conservation of energy with a few things thrown in for good measure. And the same thing with this one over here. That's the same thing as this one over here. Not only have we shown that the Schrodinger equation is nothing more than just the conservation of energy applied to quantum systems with a few extra things thrown in for good measure, but we've also showed why we need the complex numbers. And it's no deep mystical reason. It's just that it makes the math a lot simpler. We can either have this equation over here, just one line, or we can use these two equations over here, which have the psi's and the psi, well, the psi 1's and the psi 2's mixed up between them. These are known as coupled differential equations. And these two equations, this one and this one, is absolutely equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. You can use whichever one you want to do physics with. But as far as I know, this, it's, I've ever only seen these two equations when people are showing you why you don't really need complex numbers. But everybody does quantum mechanics with complex numbers simply because it's so much easier, so much neater, and it saves you about half the math that you would need to do otherwise. And that's everything I wanted to do in this video. By now, hopefully you understand that a Schrodinger equation isn't much more than just a restatement of the law of conservation of energy with the assumption that what we're dealing with isn't particles but waves. And that even though the complex numbers in the Schrodinger equation make everything a lot neater, they're not strictly necessary. 
and they're really just a mathematical convenience. And in the next video, I'll be talking about the wave function and what it actually means, since we completely glossed over it in this video. I'll see you then.